Hello, and thank you for joining us today on The Happiness Quest. My name is Jess Dutal from the Center for Transformation at Plymouth State University. And I'm Dr. Maria Sanders, a philosophy professor at Plymouth State University and CEO on Philosophy for Life. And so today on the Happiness Quest show, uh, we're going to discuss a topic that's not one that is regularly discussed in terms of happiness, uh, but within this concept of eudaimonia, so a full and flourishing life, uh, I feel it becomes a very essential topic, and that's the topic of grief. Mm -hmm. uh, when we experience some sort of loss, and the deeper the loss in our life, uh, how do we work our way through that and uh, find our way back to joy and the a full and flourishing life? Um, you know, I, as I was preparing for this particular show, I stumbled on a quote that I felt really nailed uh, the core of this topic, and it's an ancient uh, philosopher, Aeschylus, but he actually said there's no pain so great as the memory of joy in the presence of grief. Yes. And so when we're really in the heart of it, the muck, so to speak, uh, how do we find our way back to happiness, you know, and joy in our life? And I found it very interesting uh, before the show when we were discussing the difference between what is actually meant by grief and other terms such as bereavement. Yes. Uh, why don't you share on air what you were sharing in your research? Yeah, so I read a great article um, from Psychology Today written by Will Meek. And the distinction between grief and bereavement really uh, captivated me. Grief is a psychological, emotional experience following a loss of any kind, whether it is a relationship, loss, job, house, game, income, whatever. The, an all-encompassing definition. So we're not limiting it just to the loss of a loved one. Correct, body. whereas right. bereavement is a specific type of grief related to someone dying. Okay. Yeah. So what we're really focused on today then is this broader conception of grief. So a loss of any sort. It mm -hmm. might be a relationship. Uh, it might be, and you know, we both have children, it could be the loss of a pet. Yes. Uh, it could be the loss of a job. And now trying to figure out how to move what's through next? this and yeah, what's next in our life? Yeah. Where do we go from there? Yeah. So when we think about different strategies uh, for finding happiness, uh, both in the times of loss as well as uh, as we work our way through. Because again, especially if it's a loss of a very deep nature, more than likely it's never going to completely go away. Uh, it's a, a life changer of sorts. Absolutely. You know, so really what we're looking for is that pathway to work our way through the loss, uh, by no means ignoring it. Uh, and again, this is where uh, I... I want to be a little careful in using that term happiness, uh, it may be more accurate for us to use the term eudaimonia today because when I hear happiness, all too often we have this current conception of it as a feeling. And we're definitely not talking about plastering a smile on our face or forcing laughter when that's really not what the person is feeling. That one of the most important things in a time of true loss, deep loss, uh, is to feel what you're feeling and to acknowledge that our feelings cannot be incorrect. You know, if I'm feeling happy uh, when everyone around me is feeling sadness, um, I think about uh, my grandmother's funeral. Now, this is going back a few years, but I was very, very close to my grandmother. And when she passed, I was actually in New York at the time, and she was in Pennsylvania, and I made the drive through the night back for her uh, wake and funeral. And I can remember several moments during the actual wake when people around me were all in tears, and I mean, the sadness was like very visible, and you could feel the thickness in the room. And yet, I actually felt happy at times, and it was remembering our time together. There yes. were li little triggers, like they had photos of her uh, kind of dispersed around the room, and it brought back all of these, because most of my memories with my grandmother were very positive. And I remember this sense of guilt, you know, like, how can you stand here in the middle of a funeral and feel joy? And it was really well placed because it was joy at these memories. I had very joyful memories with my grandmother. And yet at the same time as I'm looking around, it felt 
extremely inappropriate. Like it, the expectation was to be in tears. Mm. And so that was, a, as a philosopher, a real learning moment for me. Yeah. Um, because when it comes to our feelings, we feel what we feel. Right. And they can't be right, they can't be wrong, they just are. And in, in any moment. experience that you're going through in life, it's about honoring what you're feeling without judgment, right? Exactly. And so I think you remember when my grandmother passed away um, a year ago this past fall now, yeah. it was the first week of school. So she didn't pass in a very convenient time period for us. And so the sense of guilt in even thinking about how are we going to make these arrangements and how are we going to take our children out of school in the first week? and Almost like how, fitting in it, someone's death. Yes. Right. But I have to tell you, and you know, I shared this with you upon returning back home from her funeral, and I didn't share with many people. Now I'm about to. <laughs> I actually had a wonderful experience at my grandmother's wake and funeral. It was about unplugging, coming out of our normal routine, being with all of my relatives who shared in this love for this woman and celebrating her life. She was 87 when she passed, so she lived a really long, very beautiful life. And um, it was sad. There were many tears mm -hmm. as we shared stories and reminisced, but there was also a lot of laughter because she was very funny. And we shared that sense of joy in you know those, those funny times that we had and the memories that we shared together. So it was about living in the present. And I think even though, again, that sense of guilt that, oh, I'm looking around, I'm probably not supposed to be having fun. It was through the laughter, through supporting each other in those tearful moments, just being present together that helped me understand grief is a part of life. It's a part of our full experience. And when we try to move through it too quickly or to numb it or to get away from it, run away from it, and we don't have the time to experience that pain, then um, sometimes you we're haunted by it on the flip side of that, if we get stuck in it and have a hard time moving on, mm -hmm. that can also be haunting. It, it can become all-encompassing. Absolutely. Well, there but. are so many things that you just mentioned in that story that you were sharing of your, your grandmother's passing. And I have to admit, because I moved away from my hometown, um, I don't tend to see all of my relatives on a regular basis except for weddings and funerals. Mm -hmm. Those seem to be the yeah. two occasions when everyone makes the trip back to the hometown. Um, so there is, whether it's uh, what's traditionally thought of as a very positive occasion, you know, a wedding versus a more traditionally negative occasion uh, of loss and a funeral, in both of these cases, there are these moments of being present with individuals that we're not seeing on a regular basis. We're not able to spend a lot of face-to-face -face time. Uh, we definitely stay right. in contact, but it's very different than being in the same place, experiencing similar things at the same time. Yeah. Um, so there is something joyous about that, you know, coming together uh, regardless of the reason. Uh, and this is something that uh, with my family, we, we recognized this about six, seven years ago. And so now uh, we'll take turns. It's not a full-blown family reunion. It's really just someone decides on a location and whoever can make it can make it. There is no uh, pressure. There's no judgment. Everyone is at different places in their life. Some have very young children, which mm -hmm. make it a little more difficult to travel. Others have raised their children, so it's easier now. And so it becomes uh, almost that excuse to get together to take a break from the daily routines, which all too often, especially in the United States, we don't do. We're in these very fast-paced, right. uh, almost habitually driven lifestyles, um, that it's as simple as just giving ourselves that excuse to say, okay, I'm gonna check out and just be present And permission for a while. to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And I think it's in that coming together and sharing our feelings of grief I think that can be really healing. In fact, so the day before Thanksgiving this past year, my nine-year-old son, Caleb's fish died. Oh, wow. And, you know, out of all three children, Caleb is our feeler. And so yeah. this hit him intensely. And it was Evan the fish. We had Evan for almost a full year. And Caleb adored this fish. I have a picture of 
Caleb, oh. and his fish, Evan. I mean, Evan was truly a member of our family. And so when he passed, it was pretty difficult, very painful for Caleb. And so we decided we'll have a memorial service for Evan on Thanksgiving because my parents came, my brother, his fiance, my aunt, were all gathered together. We went outside, we dug a little hole for Evan the fish, mm -hmm. and we all said something about a memory that we had of him. And even I was surprised by how moving and touching and healing this was, just to share in the experience. My aunt even brought a little poem that she read. And uh, when it was Caleb's turn, he went last and he talked about his memory of Evan. And he later had said how meaningful it was that our family took time to show gratitude for the difference that this little tiny fish made in our life in terms of bringing us joy. Because in every circumstance, every story that we shared, there was this little kernel of joy that we got from this little life. And so it was Thanksgiving, um, and I at first hesitated to you know, have a memorial on Thanksgiving. I felt like, oh, maybe it's gonna bring us down you know, into a dark space. But it was a really beautiful thing to do in terms of showing appreciation and expressing gratitude. So, and I, I think it was really healing for Caleb. Well, and it shows the importance of these rituals yeah. that we have. It, it gives a closure of sorts, uh, as well as a, a means to celebrate the life that the person had, yeah. or that, the in fish. this case, the fish. You know, whatever yeah. that living thing was that touched our lives. Yeah. You know, I recall um, one of the first pets that my son Austin had was a hermit crab. Mm -hmm. And we, at the time, we lived near South Padre Island, so hermit crabs were pretty easy to come by. And sort of like a fish, even I would say probably more so, uh, they're not an animal or a pet that's typically associated as like a really cuddly, loving right. type animal. Yeah. Um, so we had uh, picked up hermit crabs for, at the time, uh, it was my oldest three kids, but they were pretty little. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Jasmine was only four, so that means Austin would have been five and Kyle would have been seven mm -hmm. at the time. So they were all still pretty young. And each one picked out a hermit crab and they had it in their little box, you know, the little cage for them. But the difference with Austin's hermit crab, this was a very unique hermit crab. It would <laughs> he crawl. He personality. All, it did. <laughs> it would crawl all <laughs> over him. It would, like he would walk around the house, it would be sitting on his shoulder. And I'm like, this is like a caring hermit crab. <laughs> and I, and I, we had had quite a few yeah. that this had as not happened before. As cuddly as hermit crabs come. He was reaching out into that, yes, the, the cuddly it. stage. Well, unfortunately, because this hermit crab had as much personality as it had, it ended up coming to an early demise because it would always basically hang on Austin's mm. clothes. It went into the washing machine and the dryer. Oh no! Unbeknownst to us, oh, that's and so tragic. the hermit crab had this passing. Yeah, and it was one of those first moments of loss, mm. uh, really, for any of my children um, because they were too young uh, to even remember when some of the family members had passed. So the loss of the pet. Yeah. was one of the earlier. And again, we gave a lot of thought to what kind of ritual do you do for a hermit crab? And what is the purpose yeah. you know, of that ritual? You know, as you were sharing um, your Evan. celebration, mm -hmm. really, for the passing of the fish, in part we're celebrating the life the that life. that living thing had, but even more so, these rituals really are for the living. They're not really for the one who passed or the thing that passed if it's not a human mm. being. Um, and I think that's why when I go back to my grandmother's funeral, uh, there were definitely traditional expectations. Um, it was uh, a religious driven ritual. Mm. Uh, and so uh, the, the wake, the funeral, the involvement of the church, a lot of that was driven by religious beliefs that my family held. Uh, but then there was this other layer that was always present, whether we acknowledged it or not, that this was a means for, in a way, gaining closure, saying goodbye, moving through to, if we want to think of it as a new relationship, but it, it, in a way it's a new relationship yes. now with this departed individual. So it was really for the living. Yeah. And that comes back to 
if that's the case, then whatever we're feeling can't be judged as correct or incorrect because it is for yeah. us. And it really is about the healing and the closure, right? Mm -hmm. And this idea of having a new relationship. And so in this article that I mentioned, um, it it spoke about how one of the most influential researchers, Sidney Zissuk, um, really talked about the four major components of grief being uh, having this idea of separation distress, the traumatic distress, the guilt, remorse, and regrets that we sometimes feel in the social withdrawal. And then how do you really move through those levels of grief in terms of how can we, how can we make it perhaps easier to gain closure and to heal so that we're not getting stuck in where we are. So um, he explains that what helps us grieve is staying physically active, connecting with life, remembering that we are still living, and making meaning right? Putting mm -hmm. the grief in context, honoring the loss. I think the ideas of our rituals are really important in terms of gaining that closure and then taking time for the loss and time for life. So when we, we left the first week of school, we took that time to right. be present and to move through that pain instead of, and I think we typically do this in our, in our society. We try to numb it, push it away. But as you have said so many times, when we try to numb the pain, we also then numb the joy. And it's so right. important to move through that pain. Well, and to realize this isn't some magical amount of time. Yes. In other words, the time it takes for you to move through that may be very different from the time it takes for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. So as long as we remain very aware that we're still moving yes. and we're not uh, getting stuck and just ruminating, you know, in one place, mm -hmm. um, that as long as there's any movement at all, what may take one person a day or a week or a month may take another five or 10 years. Absolutely. But they should see some sort of movement, yes. some sort of growth towards moving through the loss. Yeah. And if they're not seeing that, that's where they may be getting stuck. Yes. And, and another important point is not to judge your feelings, not Absolutely. to feel like I should be getting over this quicker. Mm -hmm. Right. Because again, it all moves in its own in time. In its own time. And I think for me, in terms of the loss that I felt, especially with loved ones passing and, and certainly moving into this new relationship, keeping the memories, carrying them with me, um, I have some trinkets and mementos that I tried mm -hmm. to keep. I wear every single day a ring that my grandmother used to wear, and this is really important to me. It helps me remember her helps me to bring her legacy and her light into my experiences. I also brought this tomato. Um, <laughs> it is a, a ketchup dispenser tomato that my grandparents used to have, my dad's parents, and I remember loving this thing. This was a treasure to me. Every time we went over to my grandparents' house, I would run to the refrigerator to get out the ketchup dispenser. And I, there's something very satisfying about, you know, squeezing a tomato and having ketchup come out. And so when they pass and we were cleaning out their, uh, their things, I, I asked, can I have the, the tomato, the ketchup tomato? And sure enough, I have it. My children also love this. And it, you know, it's from the 50s. But it's a connection. And it's a connection that I have. Right. I also, um, I have an aunt who passed away from cancer, and Brian also has an aunt who passed away from cancer prior to our daughter being born. And so she's got two middle names, Emma, DJ, Faith. And the D and the J stand for Denise and Janice, our aunts. Oh, that's lovely. And so when we were preparing her nursery, I had made this, I mean, not from hand, but I went to, you know, the local, and it's green, so I have to put it against something white. <laughs> I went to the, you know, local craft shop and I got these butterflies to represent transformation. And I put the initials of our two aunts, Denise and Janice, on these little butterflies and these hang still in Emma's room. Her so namesake. it comes back to creating meaning. Yes. Making the connections, yes, creating the meaning. meaning. And that does really help moving through the loss. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But like we said, it's not just about death right? There's right. other ways that we experience grief. Well, and in making connections, it might be through mementos, like some of those that you yeah. shared. Um, I, you know, drawing back to my grandmother's passing, I recall um, my mother 
uh, gave each of us a piece of her jewelry, mm -hmm. uh, which she had had that my grandmother had passed to her. Uh, and it was only uh, a couple months ago, I was out visiting my sister, and she had a particular necklace that my grandmother had valued very highly and had uh, worn frequently, not really worth a lot of money, mm. um, but it was something she valued highly. And here my sister had saved it and she gave it to me. And she's like, I actually held on to this. I feel like you should have it. She's like, you were always so close to grandma mm -hmm. and she would have thought of you. And it, so it had this very interesting connection almost through because my sister and I are extremely close. So it came through our relationship, recognizing connections we had with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I do recall when I was returning to New York after her funeral, so it was all still very raw. And I wanted some sort of connection. You know, I, I felt the need in the moment for that. And one thing I always associated with my grandmother, uh, which was viewed a little negatively um, by my parents because my grandmother was diabetic. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't supposed to have any sweets or candy, but she had a sweet tooth like no one uh, I'd ever met since or before her. And so she would have these stashes of candy. And as a child, whenever we came to visit, she would always pull out little stashes of candy. And I'm, I don't really have a sweet tooth. Mm -hmm. Um, so I associate candy, even to this day, with my grandmother because it was one of the few occasions in my childhood that I actually ate candy, and particular candies, like the ones that she always had on hand. One of them were, I don't know if you recall those caramels that had the little cream oh, in the center. Yeah. They used to be really popular. Yeah. Now you have to search to even find them. She always had those on hand. <laughs> and so I recall stopping at a uh, convenient mart picking up some candy and literally snacking on this candy on the entire drive back to New York, which again, I don't eat a lot of candy, so I had a full blown upset mm -hmm. belly by the time I made it back. Um, but it was a way of connecting. There was With a her. presence, yeah. right, that through something that probably on its surface seemed very mundane in a day-to-day -day, mm -hmm. uh, event. So it's interesting as we live our lives uh, and we don't always think about it in the moment, the impact that we're having on other people and what our friends, our children, um, even those that may seem quite removed from us or strangers, but they recognize you or they feel an impact you're having on their life, mm -hmm. what they're going to take away from that, you know, especially as we're no longer here in our physical forms. Right. Um, so it's interesting how we reach out and uh, make those connections. Um, you know, you brought up these stages and uh, going through grief, and I'm not as familiar with the psychologist mm -hmm. that you had mentioned. Um, I know Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has mm -hmm. gotten a lot of attention with her five stages, and it's something I wanted to at least mention today because quite often I hear her referenced as a scholarly source or a researcher. And I think we have to be very careful here. Um, her five stages of grief, which people may be familiar with, the denial, anger, right. bargaining, mm -hmm. depression, and acceptance. Uh, they've become really popular, well-known, uh, but she wasn't really researching grief. Uh, she worked with uh, people who had terminal illnesses. So she was research, not really, I, I wouldn't even use the term research. She was working more in the area of death and dying. So not so much as another party experiencing bereavement, the loss of a loved one, or right. grief in its broader sense of mm -hmm. loss, but what she was working with is People the individual who's it. actually going through yeah. it. And, and so it's a very different lens. Right, and this researcher was looking at people experiencing it secondhand. Okay, so right. again, and I think that's important yeah. to keep in mind those different lenses because a lot of times her five stages, which by the way, there has been a lot of subsequent research mm -hmm. that has questioned the credibility of these as stages. Um, it, it feels more like they are common things that individuals, even though not everyone that goes through grief mm -hmm. experiences all five, um, but even for those that do, it's very rare it's in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. it, it's more like a grab bag. Right. And so you experience these things, but you're not gonna move through it by first having denial and then moving to the next stage. It's yeah. more we go through 
in kind of a, a hodgepodge. Yeah. And sometimes method. you can go back, right? right. It doesn't it happen goes back and forth, and, and that's yeah. why it may be better to think of it like a grab bag, where right. there's these feelings, mm -hmm. and it's not a one size fits all mm -hmm. by any means. And it's specific to experiencing death and dying, right? As you're going through it, and uh, but it is valuable in so far as when she wrote her book, which has become very popular, was why people are familiar with these five stages. She actually came up with these after she had landed her book deal. Mm -hmm. And so she was drawing on her experiences working with uh, people who were going through terminal illnesses. And there's a real value to it um, because she was one of the first to really shed a light on that. Um, but I do caution individuals who are dealing with loss of another, a loved one, uh, don't set some sort of uh, five or four step yeah. program that right. you're gonna it's definitely not that rigid and again it comes back to you're going to feel and go through what you feel and what you go through and to allow that to happen is the most valuable thing we can do for ourselves and for our healing is to actually feel it and go through it yeah you know, and it's then really of course important. Coming out on the other end as the philosopher, then I always want to say, well, what did we learn from that? You know, yeah. what, what did I, what meaning did I take from that experience? Because again, that's what makes me a richer person and developing more meaningful living is to always kind of have that reflective lens. Um, yeah. But sometimes when we're in the muck of it, we can't turn on the reflective lens. It's a little too much. Uh, so uh, there's nothing wrong with just feeling it in the moment. Right. Okay. Um, Couple interesting questions here when it comes to grief. Uh, researchers have started to consider whether gender impacts grief. In other words, do men grieve differently than women? And th I found this extremely interesting because the findings are very mixed. Uh, some researchers come out very adamantly and say absolutely, and a lot of it has to do with the cultural expectations. Uh, that females tend to be associated more with emotions and showing those emotions, uh, where males have been taught in a lot of Western civilizations to hide those yeah, emotions. Keep it in. But for every study I found that drew that conclusion, there were an equal number of studies going, yeah, no, that's not really what's happening. Mm -hmm. Because when we think about grief, it's not so much the face, the public face we're putting on, we become very good, whether we're male or female, at putting the masks on. Sure. And playing into expectations that our society might have. So as researchers kind of peeled the onion back, so to speak, uh, and they started to look at what people were actually experiencing, it seemed more difficult to draw some sort of gender mm -hmm. line. Uh, that again, it feels more like this one size doesn't fit all, and regardless of gender, people go through grief in their own way. And a lot of it has to do with the relationship that uh, existed prior to the loss. Right. Uh, you know, and so how deep it is and the type. Different. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And even experiencing a similar loss, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, the loss of a home, the, we all experience it differently because we all have a different connection to right. those various areas of our life and the people in our lives. So. And they can be, because they put us in these very vulnerable positions, they can be our greatest moments for yeah. developing and growing as a human being um, because we do learn the most when we're in those vulnerable yeah. states. Okay. Uh, another one that was uh, rather interesting here, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Sean Aker. I love Sean Okay, Aker. yes. Uh, yeah. He's probably best known for The Happiness Advantage, yes. uh, which became one of his uh, very, very popular books, although he's written several now. He has this term uh, called rational optimism. And I love this concept uh, that what he recommends is rational optimism for coping with grief. Uh, he says happiness is not about sugarcoating reality. It's not about plastering on that smile uh, when it's not what we're actually feeling. Um, but instead, what he's arguing for is resiliency. You know, developing the ability to bounce back. Yeah. And the only way to do that, again, is to work through the feelings, uh, keep moving forward, but not forcing it, you know, moving at the pace that comes naturally. Mm. Uh, and so he calls it rational optimism, that when I use reason to actually think about uh, what I'm feeling and placing it in a context of reality, um, but putting it like this positive light, Mm -hmm. uh, a positive perspective on it. 
Uh, one of the things you had mentioned a little earlier was focusing on um, the people that are still living, focusing on the impact the person who has passed had on the lives, our own life as well as those around us. Those are the positive lenses. Yeah, taking you know, the positive with you as you move through. And that's that optimism he's referring to, which leads to, in the brain, literally developing resiliency. Yes. And we bounce back. And with think, all losses, we bounce back quicker. Yes, and I think there's an aspect of just pure acceptance. Without approaching your feelings through judgment, just accepting what you're feeling, right? And Without especially placing negative or positive. The things we can't control, which... Right. Even though, again, in today's fast-paced society, it tends to be difficult for us to admit this uh, quite often, there's actually very little that we can truly control. Right. We create these perceptions that we're in control. Makes us feel better. It makes us feel better. <laughs> um, but if I just accept yes. you know, the, all the many, many things that I really don't have control over, then there is automatically an optimism that mm -hmm. starts to click in um, because again, it's being present. And acceptance can be incredibly healing. Not resisting mm -hmm. what you're feeling. It takes a lot of energy to resist. It does. Yeah, that pushing so, back. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way, it's fighting uh, the natural flow of life, you know, and life's force. So I see we're almost out of time. What's our takeaway lesson from today's conversation? Well, I think th what we kind of keep coming back to is this idea that we need to feel the feelings in the moment and for as long as they're present. In other words, not forcing uh, on some sort of scheduled time or preconceived notion of how long it should take. So to feel what we're feeling without judgment, but continue moving forward, forward. or Taking moving in a direction. Even if mm -hmm. I can't see where forward is in the moment, uh, not getting caught up just ruminating in right. the same place or stuck in that mud, so to speak. And one thing that can help us continue to move forward is connecting with other people, I Absolutely. think. Absolutely. Right? Because Absolutely. then we don't feel isolated and alone in our feelings. So connecting and talking and, and sharing and taking when those we're not steps. bottling yes. it all up inside. Yeah. So I think we should end with one of my favorite authors, uh, who you'll probably recognize, Dr. Seuss. Yes. <laughs> and what Dr. Seuss said is, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. I love that. Right. Thank you Thank for joining you. us.